This podcast is a proud member of the Edify Podcast Network. Listen to thousands of Christian podcasts at edify.app. That's E-D-I-F-I dot app. Today's episode contains discussion of sexual sin and may not be suitable for younger listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, my name is Kim Meandering. My husband and I live in Hot Springs Village, Arkansas. We love listening to Compelled to hear how God pursues people's hearts and souls relentlessly, like in episode number 49, when Ron Atkins meets Jesus in his maximum security prison cell. These stories challenge us to walk closely with God, and we so appreciate the ministry of Compelled. I'm Paul Hastings, and you're listening to Compelled, where we use gripping, immersive storytelling to bring Christian testimonies to life. Our last episode was with Steve Richardson. When he was just a child, Steve and his parents traveled halfway across the world to New Guinea and moved in with a tribe of Stone Age cannibals and headhunters. Their purpose? To share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the ends of the earth. Their reception? Unbelievable. Again, that's our previous episode with Steve Richardson. This week, our guest is Eric Hovind, who grew up in a Christian household and served faithfully in his family's Christian ministry, volunteered at church, and always knew all the right answers. Yet at the same time, he was harboring a secret double life of sexual addiction. But one night, he came face to face with a shocking realization. He was the product of Christian culture and teaching but he was a total stranger to Christ. So gather around, lean in, and join us for another compelling story from the kingdom of God. I first learned about Eric about four years ago when I was watching part of his testimony on a short video clip. And I thought it was interesting enough that I added it to our list of potential podcast guests. Now, for those of you who don't know, we actually keep a very large spreadsheet of potential guests from all over America and even the world. And just because we add someone to the list doesn't mean they're automatically going to be a guest someday, but at least they're on our radar and we might investigate further as time goes on. And because we record all of our compelled interviews in person, face-to-face, we try to batch as many interviews as possible when we know we'll be recording in a certain area. So back in January, I knew that I was already going to be in Orlando, Florida. Eric lives in Pensacola, which is also in Florida, but because I'm not from the state, I didn't fully realize how far apart those two cities are. They're actually about seven hours away from each other. In fact, it would actually be faster for Eric to drive across Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana all the way to Texas than it would be for him to get to Orlando. But hey, I had nothing to lose, right? So I shot Eric an email totally out of the blue and asked if he just happened to be in Orlando the same week that I would be. And as I'm sure you can already guess, he said that he would be. And I can only point to providential timing for that. Two weeks later, Eric and I sat down and he launched right in, starting with his life growing up in the 1980s. I was born into a family of a loving mom, a loving dad, and it was amazing. I had an amazing upbringing. My dad was a high school science teacher, loved teaching us about physics and mathematics and loved building stuff. He and his dad had built stuff all their life. So man, I was with my dad while we were building houses and we would build forts in the backyard. I mean, swings like crazy, man. We had adventures all the time. Motorcycles growing up, I mean, and it was always We didn't have a lot of money, so my dad and mom were in ministry, so it was always, let's find a junk motorcycle, let's fix it up together, son, and then, man, let's ride the wheels off of this thing. And so it was a constant, fun learning environment. Being a high school teacher, my dad was was literally taking every opportunity to teach. And when I was young, I loved it. And then I hit the middle school, high school years where I was like, oh my goodness, you're just trying to teach me something again. And I got to that. I don't know if I really want to learn anymore. I think I'm good. I'm done learning. And man, looking back now on my childhood, I go, wow. I had a mom that was a music teacher that gave me a love, tried to give me even more of a love, but I got a love for music. I loved truth. 
I loved that my mom and my dad, they would live out what they truly believed. And as I look back and I go, yeah, they might have believed some things that we may not hold to now. They truly lived out what they thought was true. And that is one of the biggest impacts on my life. Well, I was brought up, as my dad would say, in an independent, temperamental, fundamental, Bible-believing, chicken-eating Baptist church. So that's my upbringing is uh, the independent, fundamental movement. And when I say they really lived out what they believed, they didn't just teach, for example, you know, women shouldn't wear pants, you know. Well, they really practiced it. I mean, so I remember my sister's culottes, you know, and I remember these things. And so there's there's this, this element of, they didn't just say it. What I appreciated is they were not hypocritical. So I didn't have hypocritical parents. Looking back, that's one of the big things that I certainly appreciate is they were not hypocritical about their beliefs. They really believed it and they really applied it. Uh, my dad truly believed discipline a child. <laughs> and, and so I got disciplined and it was always with love, but I got disciplined. And being a parent now, it's, man, sometimes easier to say, forget the discipline. I don't want to do that. And oh my goodness, I'm so thankful that my parents disciplined me in my life. It was a loving discipline that they gave me. So I really appreciate that. I never really questioned God growing up. My parents not only believed it, they taught it. We would do devotions growing up. So at night, it was the kids gathered around and my dad opening the Word of God and then us asking questions and talking about uh, the Bible, talking about Bible stories. He would take an apple and I just, as a kid, I vividly remember him cutting up the apple and talk about genius. It was, how thin of a piece of apple can I cut? You know, and so he's cutting these razor thin pieces of apple and we wanted the thinnest one possible. How he talked us into that, I don't know. That's pretty good. But man, we wanted the super thin piece. It wasn't about getting the big one. And of course that made devotions go longer and we just loved it. And, or whatever it was, raisins was another big thing. So whoever gets the question right gets a raisin. And it was just one of those teaching techniques that he was so good at. And the education process of pouring into us scripture. So not only were we real Christians at home, and practiced it at church growing up in the Awana program, approved workmen that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we were soaking our minds in scripture all the time. And I think for me, I really didn't have to question as I grew up, is God real? I had loving parents that demonstrated God's love to me. What I didn't know looking back is I ended up becoming the product of a Christian environment rather than a true disciple of Jesus Christ. The witness of Eric's parents was a powerful factor in his early childhood, but at the same time, there were other influences that began to creep in, first in seemingly small ways, but they soon grew into a strong and harmful force in Eric's life. During the same time I was growing up and being loved on by my family and loved on by my church, I was also getting exposed to sin. I remember uh, third grade is when uh, a neighbor boy exposed me to homosexuality. I remember fifth grade in a Christian school when some of the boys talked about the fact that they had already had sex with this kid's sister and then brought pornography into the bathroom and showed me for the first time I'd ever seen pornography. I'm like, oh my goodness. And that right there was the hook that Satan used to grab a hold of Eric Hoven's life and literally drag him into the depths of sin. And because it was secret, because nobody knew, I continued to put on this facade of, oh, I'm a good Christian. I, I know what to do. I mean, I had learned what to do. I had learned what to say. I had learned how to act. I, I knew what kind of clothes I was allowed to wear and what kind I wasn't. And so... My problem was I had become a Pharisee. I knew the law. I knew, you know, what I was supposed to do. And I tried to obey that in order to be a good Christian rather than true Christianity, which is, man, you are loved by God and you are forgiven. Why would you want to live in sin? Why would you want that? So. As I'm growing up and I'm getting more and more into my private sins, I am 
I am pretending to be a Christian. I am going to youth group. I'm leading in my youth group. I'm leading missions trips. I'm, I'm doing all these things, but at the same time, I've got my secret sin that nobody knows about. I always thought that when I was 12 years old, well, by the time you're 14, you won't be dealing with you know, sexual sin anymore. The, the, you you kind of mature out of it. And then you get to 14 and you think, okay, okay, I, I'm still looking at porn. I, okay, by the time you're 16, that's when this is done, you know, because it wasn't talked about in the church. It wasn't addressed. It's not like this was a conversation that we could have. This is like super embarrassing. Nobody wants to admit it. So then I thought, well, 16 years old comes along and I'm like, okay, this is still an issue. Well, surely when I'm 18, that's not going to be a problem anymore. And then when you're 18, you think, well, maybe that's why the 21, you know, rule is in effect and you can drink at 21. That's when it's not a problem anymore. And you go through life and Satan just keeps telling you, oh, later, 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 later. And you find out it will never, ever, ever end until you put it to death. Thankfully, growing up, I was not ignorant of my friends who also struggled because we'd talk about it and we'd try to have these little accountability meetings but when you're having an accountability meeting with one of your best friends sometimes it turns into a non-accountability meeting where we're talking about some of the stuff that we'd done or some of the stuff that we'd seen or some of the videos that we'd watched and it just didn't didn't turn into always a healthy conversation I did have an unbelievable youth pastor growing up so he was almost like my second dad Jeff Redlin now the pastor of Campus Church in Pensacola, Florida. And what he did talk about, he did talk about purity. He did talk about holiness. I knew coming from a Christian home that that God desired purity, God desired righteousness, God desired holiness. And and there would be retreats and there would be camps and there would be speakers that would speak. And then, you know, you go up and talk to them afterwards. And so, yes, I talked to my youth pastor. I talked to one of our assistant youth pastors, Josh Schwartz, and he was a just an amazing, amazing man that loved to serve, funny as all get out. I mean, you cannot be around him without laughing. And I remember talking to him. One of the best things that my youth pastor, Jeff Redline, that sticks in my mind, one of the things he told me, he said, Eric, you know, your brain is kind of like a computer hard drive. And as you put more and more stuff in there, once it kind of, quote, gets full, some stuff has to fall off. So you need to be filling your mind so much with scripture that the other things end up just falling off the plates, falling off the hard drive, so to speak. You're not thinking of those things, and you're thinking so much about Scripture. And that's certainly something that helped me in my in my battle, in my struggle as I was growing up. As I'm going through my high school years, pornography for me was, I knew it was wrong, so I struggled with it. And so I'd have times, you know, days, weeks, sometimes months of my purity streak, and then, oh, you fall again. And you, you, when you fall, when you're in a legalistic environment, when you fall, you think, ah, oh, I, I can't, I can't go right away and ask for forgiveness. I mean, I got to put some time between my fall and my ask for forgiveness because otherwise God's not going to think I'm serious. I mean, after all, how many times have I come to God asking for forgiveness for the exact same thing? So you got to put some time in there. That way God knows that you're, you're real about this. So for me, there were times when it was a daily issue, there were times when it was a weekly issue, and then there were times when it was a monthly issue. I had never really been educated on sexuality. I had never really been, from a biblical perspective, never really been educated on uh, masturbation, never been educated on how, how do we treat our body as the temple of God. And I think that too often we focus on all the don'ts rather than what we get to do. And too often, I was the product of, hey, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And so therefore, I'm thinking about all the don'ts rather than all the things that I should be doing, all the things that I get to do, the freedoms that we have in Christ, the the love that we can have one for another. So sometimes I wonder if we focus too much on the don'ts and not enough on the do's. And then at the same time, I'm not clear myself with how much do we do that. I just know that if I tell you don't think of a Twinkie, you're thinking of a Twinkie, you know? At the same time Eric was secretly going through the roller coaster of temporary victory and then relapse, to the outside world, he was a bright and successful Christian following in his father's footsteps. His parents had a burgeoning creation ministry. And as he entered young adulthood, Eric found himself taking a more prominent role in the ministry. By 1999, Eric had met, 
fallen in love, and married his wife, Tanya, beginning a family life of his own. But little did Eric know that God would soon use Tanya to rip back the curtain on his secret life of sin. More on that after the break. Just a couple months ago, I had the privilege of visiting the Masters University near Los Angeles. If you haven't heard of the Masters University before, there's a very good chance you've at least heard of their longtime president, Dr. John MacArthur, who served at the school for over 30 years while also pastoring Grace Community Church in Southern California and preaching on the Grace to You radio program. Dr. MacArthur is now the chancellor of the school and continues to be involved with the university's strategic decisions, like their choice to come back from the California COVID lockdowns as quickly as possible and resume in-person instruction and discipleship. The Masters University doesn't just care about providing a quality education for students, which they do, but more importantly, they are passionate about cultivating a deep and abiding love of Christ and His Word. Dr. MacArthur has been a trusted voice in the Christian community for over 50 years, and he and I both strongly recommend the Master's University to anyone pursuing higher education who also cares about preparing for a life of eternal influence. Learn more at masters.edu. Again, that's masters.edu. No homeschool parent should ever feel alone. And thankfully, BJU Press has met that need by creating a homeschool curriculum that empowers and supports parents as they educate their children. Every subject is firmly grounded in a biblical worldview and challenges children to connect classroom content with real-life problems. The BJU Press curriculum offers thorough teaching resources for parents, including videos, extra activities, and various approaches for children with different learning styles. And their Homeschool Hub is an easy-to-use online platform for parents to schedule, track, and grade student assignments easily. Want to take a family field trip or spend a few extra days studying podcasting? Not that my family would ever do anything like that. Well, now it's simple. Scheduling school has never been easier. BJU Press enables you to give your children an excellent education that flows from a biblical worldview. To learn more, visit BJUPressHomeschool.com. Again, that's BJUPressHomeschool.com. Welcome back to Compelled. Up to this point, we've heard Eric Hoven describing his dual life. On the outside, he was a shining young example of what a Christian should look like, active in his church, growing responsibilities at his parents' ministry, and now newly married. At the same time though, in secret, Eric was living a double life of addiction to pornography and sexual sin. But it was about to come to a head when his new wife, Tanya, confronted him. I forget exactly how she found out, but she's like, are, are, you, are you looking at something? And I had already learned kind of in life, look, don't try to hide stuff. It, it, that, that just causes more problems. When, when you lie and you try to hide what the truth is, boy, that takes you down a, a really bad road. So I'd already learned earlier in life, man, if something is discovered, admit it right away. I mean, just, just confess. And, and you feel it inside. You know inside, I should confess this, but I'm going to try to hide it. Man, if you just learn, confess right away. I'd rather have the consequences now that are that whatever they are and whatever they are I'll take them rather than the long-term consequences that are going to come from hiding this the long-term consequences are are way worse than whatever the consequences are now so I'd learned that process in life and when my wife confronted me I said yeah yeah I have been and I really thought this was going to go away she said Eric I don't understand why you need this and you talk about breaking your heart I mean I've got a I, my wife is beautiful. I, I am I am blessed beyond measure, and yet a beautiful woman did not take away this desire to look at pornography. So more than me confessing this to my wife, it was my wife calling me out. While it was my wife that confronted me, and some men out there, man, their wives know, they, they get it, they know it's a struggle. Man, God bless those women for still loving their husbands and saying, I don't get it, I don't understand it, but I'm going to love you. But if your wife doesn't know, you need to get in a group where they train you how to go about communicating this process to your wife. 
And then you're you're now you're now at a place where you can go to your wife and say, "Listen, I'm sober. I did the sin in secret. I've done the work privately and with this group of men to help me overcome this because I want to love you with the purity that Christ loves the church." Guys, do you know why adultery and fornication is wrong? Why is cheating on a spouse wrong? Any kind of sexual sin. The reason unfaithfulness is wrong is because God is perfectly faithful. That's part of his character. That's part of his nature. And therefore, we should be perfectly faithful. And if you want to be that perfectly faithful spouse to your partner, well, then you're not going to want to bring things in that make you unfaithful. You're not going to want to lust after another woman. Science shows it messes up the brain. It really does. So why allow yourself to get messed up if you want to be perfectly faithful to your wife the way God has a perfect faith and a perfect love for us? So my wife confronted me and I confessed I realized, oh my goodness, this isn't going away. And after that is when I watched a film called Hell's Best Kept Secret by Ray Comfort. My dad had asked Ray to come speak at our staff banquet in Pensacola. And I thought, well, I better, I better watch this guy's, you know, DVD. We sell his DVD in our ministry. I better watch this thing to figure out who he is so that when he gets here, I at least know what he talks about. Please open your Bibles at Romans 3, verse 19. Romans 3, verse 19. And in this film, Hell's Best Kept Secret, Ray Comfort describes the modern gospel and compares it to the biblical gospel and says, look, the the modern gospel says, come to Jesus. He wants to give you a great life. The biblical gospel says, you are a sinner and you need a savior. He tells two stories, the story of Joseph and the story of David in this message. And he talks about how when Joseph was tempted to have sex with Potiphar's wife, What he said as he ran away is, how can I do this and sin against God? Not how can I do this and sin against you or against against Potiphar. How could I do this and sin against God? Not even against his own family. It's God he was worried about offending. And then he tells the story of David and David's sin with Bathsheba and how he killed Uriah. And here in one moment, David becomes guilty of breaking all 10 of the 10 commandments. David rents his clothes and he says, God, against you and you alone have I sinned. And I tell you, those two stories combine to make the Holy Spirit rip Eric's eyes open to his flesh and his fleshly nature that he had never been born of the Spirit. So immediately called my brother-in-law and said, dude, Pavel, you got to come over here and watch this thing with me. I put it in the DVD player, watched it. He watched it with me. And I'm, 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 I'm hearing this message that's, that's, letting me know I'm the product of a Christian environment. I'm not a real Christian. You know, Matthew 7, 21, scariest verse in the Bible. Many are going to come to me and say, did I not do all these things? Prophesy, da, da, da. And I'm going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. I'm like, that's scary. Watch it a second time. I'm like, oh my goodness. I call our youth pastor, Tim. I'm like, Tim, you got to come watch this DVD with me. He comes over to my house that night. It's like 10 o'clock. We spend an hour watching this DVD and talk about it for another hour. I'm going, oh my goodness. They go home. I'm like, I, I can't go to sleep right now. I, I hit play again. And I watched that message four times in a row in one night. And at the end of the fourth time, because I was so shocked by what I was hearing, this meant I'm not a Christian. And that's when my sin, as it were, became exceedingly sinful. I literally, right there in my living room, right in the middle, I laid down prostrate on the floor and I just said, God, I'm sorry. I I want to repent on your terms. Yes, growing up, I had been sorry. I had had been under conviction. I had apologized to people. I had cried out to God. I had said, God, I want to serve you with my life. I'd done that in high school. And this was making me realize it's against God and God alone have I sinned. I need to be sorry to God. I need to repent to God. And I tell you, that is the moment in time when the Holy Spirit gave me a heart of flesh, took away my heart of stone, opened my eyes to the truth. Scripture says that the natural man will not desire righteousness. The spirit man will desire righteousness. You'll have a God-given desire for righteousness. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. That is the point in time when I became a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things were passed away. All things were become new. I no longer wanted to look at porn. I actually desired righteousness. 
And here I am 20 years later and been porn free for over 20 years. And I'm going, wow, God, you are good. You are good. Indeed, God is good. God allowed Eric to realize that while he bore the trappings of Christian culture and could thoroughly articulate the Christian faith, he had never repented of his sins before a holy and righteous God. Sure, he had shown remorse plenty of times over his sins, and not just porn, but all kinds of sins. But Eric had never recognized that his need for a savior was solely because of his total inadequacy before a perfect God. And while Eric may have paid lip service to this idea, pure mental assent had never translated into a surrender of the heart. And as he always does, God met Eric in the darkness and brought him to the light. And while this is certainly not true of all conversion experiences, Eric's spiritual salvation brought about a surprising and lasting change in his battle with pornography. But there was still a long road of sanctification ahead. I don't think the depth of what happened really hit me immediately. I think as time went on, I'm going, oh my goodness, God, you are taking away my desire for unrighteousness and you are giving me a desire to please you. You're giving me a desire for righteousness. It became rather than my mind dwelling on how can I get access to porn, my mind began dwelling more on how do I avoid this? And that's where I started putting the guardrails in my life. How do I avoid what's what's going to lead to destruction because not because now now it wasn't because i have to obey god it was because i get to he's a loving god look what he's done for me i get to obey god it did not necessarily completely take away my flesh i'm still living in my flesh it didn't completely take away the temptations that come but i did recognize as the scripture says that Temptation is not the sin. Temptation is what leads to the sin if you leave that temptation in your mind. I guess I think of it this way when we're when we're driving down a road along a side of a mountain and there are guardrails along those very treacherous roads as you go around a corner. If those guardrails aren't there, it is easier when you mess up to go off the edge. And so the way I applied that to my life is I went, I don't just want one guardrail. I want multiple guardrails in my life to keep me from going off the cliff. And off the cliff would be looking at porn or acting out. We call that acting out masturbation. And it just, it messed up my relationship with my wife as well. When I did that, I realized, man, there is something here. There is something to acting out. It actually messes up my relationship with my wife. So I put up guardrails. I'm not allowed to be on a computer after nine o'clock at night. This was before cell phones, but another guardrail I put in my life was if something happens, if I mess up, I have to tell my wife right away. Now, that's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to go to your wife and say, hey, listen, I messed up. Now, now I look back and I realize what I was doing was accountability. And what I needed was good, genuine accountability in my life. And that's what every man needs. Men, we need accountability in our lives. We need somebody that not only we can share with, that they will love us in return. And then sometimes we need a guy in our life that will just slap us upside the head and say, dude, let's go. Come on, stop this. Okay, what led to this? How did that happen? How do I keep myself from being in those circumstances again? This was, I was tired, it was late at night, okay, then this happened. Uh, I mean, I was already traveling and preaching at this point. I had no idea the statistics that 50% of pastors behind the pulpit are struggling with pornography on a monthly basis. No idea that 70% of the men in the church that I'm talking to are struggling with, with some kind of pornography or sexual addiction in the pews. They are literally dealing with this. Everybody's dealing with this. So I had no clue. So I'm an evangelist traveling and speaking in churches. You get back to the hotel room and then you're all by yourself. I mean, life on the road looks glamorous. It is not. I would be totally fine with never traveling again, okay? But I had to put a guardrail in my life. I, I made a guardrail in my life. I never turn on a TV in a hotel room. I don't watch TV in a hotel room. I know what it does. I know where it takes my mind. I know that flipping those channels... They might offer something on TV. They might offer something on HBO. They might offer something on Showtime that my brain gets tripping. 
And as my brain's tripping, I'm like, I wonder if they're going to show something. I wonder if they're going to have a scene in here that I can meditate on. And I'm like, you know what? It's better if I just never turn the thing on. Let's put that as a guardrail in my life. So my text messages, my emails, my uh, search history, everything I do is connected to a cloud that my wife has access to, that my sister has access to, that my mom has access to, and that my administrative assistant has access to. So four different people in my life can look and see everything that I'm doing. I, I can't, unless I willfully try to hide something, I can't hide anything from them. Unless I, and people have done this, unless I go get another phone or another account or something like that, there's no hiding what I can do. And that's what I found is the best. Satan loves to take and get us to hide something small. And whatever you don't bring into the light, whatever you keep in darkness, this is a biblical principle. This isn't Eric. This is God teaching us something. Whatever you keep in darkness, that's exactly what Satan will use to drag you back down into the depths of despair. So I'm just constantly realizing, expose everything to the light. And as you expose it to the light, there's no room for sin to hide. And that's the best way to keep my life. The other big thing... Somebody had posted a video, I don't remember who it was, but it was an ex-porn star talking about the porn industry. And she began to describe the reality of the porn world, how she would have to get high or she'd have to get doped up. Something would have to happen in order to go do these things. And she would describe, because when you're looking at porn, you're looking at a pretend world. You're not looking at the truth. And that's something men need to understand. You are not seeing the truth. You are seeing a lie. You are falling for a lie. And as this ex-porn star described the reality of the porn industry, I went, why would I want to live inside of fantasy world when God has something even better for me in the real world? Why would I want to give up a beautiful relationship with my wife and give that up for, for something that's not even real? And man, as she talked about, I mean, because they try to glorify the porn industry. They try to make it seem like, oh, this is wonderful. Now I, I, I walk around, I see the hookup culture, I see the things happening, and I go, you know inside they're all just pretending. that. The, and, and sin is fun. I get it. I get it. You get your little bitty high, but you don't have long-term happiness. You don't have long-term pleasure. You don't have a long-term relationship, which brings true joy. You don't have that in your life. You have momentary satisfaction and that momentary satisfaction is really nothing but selfishness. It's humanism at the heart. It's how do I please myself? How do I glorify myself? How do I make my flesh happy? And that is short-lived. And not too long after that, you need to go get another fix. And then you need to get another fix. And then you need to get another fix. That's why they say it affects the brain exactly like drugs affect the brain. You just simply get a false high, a, fa a dopamine rush, but it's not the kind that God intended to give you long-term joy and long-term pleasure. And if you ask a, a drug addict, man, do you really want to be addicted to drugs? They'd say, no, I, I, most, once they have been in it, no, this, you do not want this. This is not the lifestyle. You don't envision yourself losing everything, end up being poor, end up being at a halfway house or end up being in jail. You don't envision that. That may not physically happen in your life. We know that that's what happens in marriage when this is our this is our struggle. You end up being in marriage jail with, with okay, did they find out? Oh, does my wife know? And you're always looking over your shoulder and you're always wondering, did I cover my tracks? And you're always wondering, did I delete my browser history? And does is anybody going to find out about this? Well, isn't it a whole lot easier to live in freedom and go, I don't have to look over my back. I don't have to worry about my browser history. Anybody, I'm an open book. Come and check me out. And I'm not being pure so that you can know I'm pure. I'm being pure because I want to be pure before God. I want to be holy before God. As Eric experienced continued and consistent freedom from sexual sin, he realized that God was opening up more doors and opportunities. In 2007, he started Creation Today, an apologetics ministry focused on teaching Christians about the intersection of the Bible and science. But besides his immediate family and closest friends, Eric had never really spoken publicly about his battle with pornography and lust. But that was all about to change, which you'll hear about right after the break. 
it's back to school season. And if you're like most families with children, you're running around like a crazy person trying to select the best education options for your kids. Let me suggest one of our compelled sponsors, CTC Math. CTC Math is an innovative online math curriculum designed for K-12 students. Their lessons are intentionally concise, helping your child break down barriers and cultivate a newfound appreciation for math. And by using video tutorials and animations, they transform difficult math concepts into easily digestible ideas. Whether you're homeschooling or seeking a supplementary math tutor for personalized learning, CTC Math guarantees to be your ideal choice. And rest assured, with their 12-month money-back guarantee, you have nothing to lose. If their curriculum isn't the perfect fit for you and your family, they'll gladly provide a full refund, no questions asked. Learn more at ctcmath.com. Again, that's ctcmath.com. Last year, my wife and I discovered a new subscription series of beautifully illustrated books for our kids called Brave Books. It's about a group of animals that live on Freedom Island and have adventures that teach them timeless truths about important topics, but at a level that's appropriate for children. The first book we read in the series was called Elephants Are Not Birds. It's about Kevin, a happy-go-lucky elephant who loves to sing. But then one day, Culture the Vulture comes to him and tells him that Kevin can actually be any animal he identifies as, including a bird. But of course, by the end of the book, Kevin realizes that he is not a bird. And in fact, God has beautifully created him to be exactly who he is, an elephant with special giftings and talents that are unique to him. Every book teaches an important lesson at an age-appropriate level, like the value of life, free speech, kindness, and more. They've got some great authors, including Missy Robertson and Kirk Cameron. And if you have a child or grandchild from age 4 to 10, then these books would be a great addition for your family. And I'm not kidding. We actually have over 20 of these books in our home, and we are constantly loaning out our copies. Check it out and get the newest book for free when you subscribe today at bravebooks.com. Again, that's bravebooks.com. And please tell them that Compelled sent you. Welcome back. We've just heard about Eric Hoven's deliverance from pornography addiction after realizing that he wasn't even a Christian. In the years following his conversion, God began using Eric in many unique ways, including running his own creation ministry, producing several gospel-centered films, and constantly looking for new ways to share Christ with others. But even though freedom from sexual sin was a huge part of his testimony, Eric had never really spoken publicly about it. And frankly, the whole topic was a little taboo, especially if you're the head of a thriving Christian ministry. But that was all about to change due to a chance encounter in 2011 that had to do with, of all things, Noah's Ark. I get booked for a radio show, and the radio show is on uh, Noah's Ark. Did with the flood? Did it really occur? And that's kind of what I talk about in my world of creation, evolution. Did God really create everything? And another guest on this show is a gentleman named Jeremy Wiles. Well, I'm sharing about Noah's flood. Then I'm hearing him talk about the fact that he's been over there. He's hiked on Mount Ararat. And I'm like, dude, he's been looking for Noah's Ark. He's actually working on a movie to, to, to discover Noah's Ark. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this dude is awesome. I got to get a hold of him. I call the radio station. I get his information. I get a hold of him. We end up becoming friends. About a year later, he's like, Eric, I'm doing this new thing. It's, it's on pornography in the church. I'm wondering if I could interview you. And did he know about your past? He had no clue. And I'm going, whoa, I had never shared publicly, like, this is who I am. This is what I've gone through, being raised in a Christian home, struggling with pornography, being raised with, with a high-profile evangelist as a father, and so really not wanting to, you know, shame the name of my father, not wanting to bring any kind of disrepute. The pressure on the children of high-profile people in the church is more, it can be more than it should be. And I just encourage parents that are high profile, don't let that pressure go down to your kids. You let them know you're my son, you're my daughter, no matter what. So Jeremy and I become friends. He says, I'm doing this series on pornography. Can I interview you? And I'm going, I don't know what I'm going to say. He comes up there, brings all this gear, brings these cameras. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. But he doesn't know your story though. No idea. So what was he going to interview about? Great question. You'll have to ask Jeremy that question. And 
And I end up just, I said, Jeremy, I'm just going to be transparent about where I've been in my life. He said, that's all we want. And at the end he went, oh my goodness. I never knew. Cause in there, I just kind of, I share everything. I'm, I'm really transparent because I'm going, if this is going to be something that men watch, they need to see other men that are transparent because there are men that think I'm the only one who struggles with this. Nobody else deals with this. And when you start finding out, listen, if you go to church, 70% of the guys around you are dealing with this. It, it, outside of the church, it's it's even a higher percentage. I don't remember the number. I thought it was 80 to 90% of men are dealing with this. And so you're going, well, if I know I'm not alone and if I know there's help, this is a good thing. And then I watched his final Conquer Series resource and I thought, this is, a, this is mind-blowing. It's teaching men how the brain works, how the synapses work, how the how the how pornography is just like a drug it is actually a drug so when i'm speaking at an event and it's for the conquer series i try to let men know listen there is a point of salvation when you repent of sin and trust in christ as your savior and then you've you got a lifetime of what we call sanctification becoming like christ so what God does for us is he gives us his Holy Spirit at salvation. He says, listen, I'm going to put a new heart in you, and this heart is going to desire righteousness. And now you got to listen to that one, and you got to put the old one to death, man. That one's got to die. The one that desires yourself, the one that desires sinfulness, that one you need to put to death. And how many passages are there? You know, the Apostle Paul, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I shouldn't do, those I do. Oh, I war. It's a battle in myself. So... Yeah, that's going to take place, and there's there's men who think because I'm battling, I'm not saved. That's not necessarily true. Real salvation is repentance and trust in Christ. Real salvation is seeing your sin before God and God alone, and saying, God, I want to get, I want to repent on your terms, not on mine, and trusting in what Christ did on the cross, His death, His burial, and His resurrection for salvation. Eric's interview, which is the first time he had ever opened up publicly about his struggle with pornography and lust ended up being featured prominently in the Conquer series, a video series designed to help Christian men overcome sexual sin. It's now been viewed over 2 million times and screened across tens of thousands of churches. And partially, as a result, Eric has been invited to share with numerous churches about his experiences, both with sexual sin and with realizing that he was simply the product of Christian upbringing, but had never actually submitted his life to Christ. I think a lot of my ministry is to people who've grown up in the church, people that are the product of a church environment rather than a disciple of Jesus Christ, exactly like I was. Now, I love challenging the skeptics. I love talking to the atheists, but man, I, I really want to reach inside the church is a mission field because statistically, 70% of the kids that grow up in our churches today are not believers in Jesus Christ. They can be the product of, it, of their environment. They can uh, have a lot of head knowledge, but they've never really been open in their heart. Their eyes haven't been open. And we know this because after leaving home, 70% will say, I no longer believe. I'm not a Christian anymore. I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe what I was brought up with. I think the reality is we've got a lot of things in church that are traditions, and we've got people bucking up against bad answers or uh, traditions and if they really studied the Word of God and they really knew who God was, they would go, yeah, that's what I want to believe in. And interviewing students on campuses, the number one thing I get is, I used to be a Christian, but man, there's a whole lot of people in church. I, I found this, I found that. And they're basically talking about hypocrisy in the church. And so I pull out a $100 bill and I set it on the table and I go, this is for you. I'm like, no, I can't take that. I say, look closely. They start looking closely and they realize on this $100 bill, it says for motion picture use only. It's a fake $100 bill. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a fake. Okay. I say, is there such a thing as counterfeit money? They go, yeah. I say, can there be counterfeit money if there's no real money? If there's not a real $100 bill, could you have a counterfeit $100 bill? And I say, no. I say, what you've seen and it's very prevalent in the church, is a whole lot of counterfeits, a whole lot of hypocrisy, a whole lot of fake. The fake doesn't mean the real thing doesn't exist. The fake is evidence that there is such a thing as the real thing, and that's what you need to be finding out. That's what you need to be discovering. What is, who is the real God? Who is the real creator of the heavens and the earth? And so 
how do we find out the real genuine artifact? How do we get to the truth? And that's what we love doing. And if you're out there and you don't think there's any hope, let me just tell you something. There is hope. Christ died for you. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that is the good news. That is the gospel message. And if you have trusted in that for your salvation, you have hope. The Bible has lots to say about practical things, about finances and relationships and communication and all the things that we struggle with in life. So dig into that to find out what he wants for you. But ultimately, there is hope in Jesus Christ. So hope in him. Don't put your faith and your trust in religious leaders. Put your hope in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Eric, thank you, man. Yeah, my pleasure, Paul. Take a minute and examine yourself, just like Eric did 24 years ago. Is it possible that you too know all of the right church answers and can give a defense of the Bible and explain the Christian faith, but you are still a stranger to Christ? In fact, as Eric mentioned, Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Just because you claim to know Christ does not mean that you actually do. And if you're unsure of what you believe, or if you are unclear as to whether you are a cultural Christian or an actual follower of Jesus Christ, let me point you to a free resource that Eric has made that will only take you about three minutes to read. It's called whyiboughtyourcoffee.com. Yes, yes, very unusual domain name, I get it, yes, but it's very memorable, okay? Whyiboughtyourcoffee.com. And if you'd like to spend a little additional time, then I would recommend watching the sermon from Ray Comfort that changed Eric's life. The sermon is called Hell's Best Kept Secret, and we'll have a link in our show notes. And of course, if you'd like to learn more about the resources for sexual purity, including the Conquer video series that Eric is part of, then head over to our show notes and we'll have a link there as well. We'll also include links to Eric's creation ministry, some of the videos he's produced, and more. And we also have two autographed copies of the Genesis 3D movie that Eric produced, and we'll be giving away those this week. If you want to enter the drawing, just head over to our website. Again, all of that's at compelledpodcast.com and pull up the show notes for this episode. By the way, Eric's story today reminds me of another episode we released, episode number 48 with Garrett Kell. For years, Garrett had chased women, drugs, alcohol, and his own pleasures. But after being radically saved, he began serving the Lord as the pastor of a growing church. Yet Garrett carried a dark secret, an addiction to pornography. But as Garrett would discover, the same Jesus who came to save the sinner also came to deliver the saints. Again, that's episode number 48 with Garrett Kell. If you enjoy listening to Compelled, can I ask for a quick favor? Can you leave a five-star rating on your podcast app? It's one of the ways that you can help the app algorithms know to recommend Compelled to more listeners. As of the time I'm recording this, we have 188 ratings on Spotify and 498 on Apple. Can you take 30 seconds and help us bump those numbers up? And of course, if you're not already following Compelled on your app, please go ahead and do so. Today's episode was edited by Will Jackson, story editing by Nathan Webster, sound engineering by Zach Thaler, and our associate producer is my wonderful wife, Sarah Hastings. Stay tuned for a sneak peek from our next story with Jurgen and Sean Beck, whose individual journeys of faith were initially separated by an ocean. Yet God brought this couple together from opposite sides of the world to minister to those around them in a very special way. I'm your host, Paul Hastings, and you've been listening to Compelled. We'll be back with another compelling story two weeks from now. We'll see you then. We drove home with Annie while her birth mother was still in the hospital recuperating. And then I get a phone call from the attorney saying, I have a little bit of bad news to tell you. The mother just called me this morning and she told me that uh, she wouldn't sign the relinquishment papers. 
So she wanted the baby back. How do you react to that? 